Shalom, James. Shalom, Rabbi. Manishma. Baruch Hashem. Shalom to all of our listeners. And Here viewers. We are, after all the intense preparation and all the, the uh, um, amazing levels of getting ready for the holiday of Passover, this week, Bezrat Hashem, God willing, we shall be welcoming the festival on Wednesday night. Mm-hmm. And it is really one of the high points of the year. Yeah. yeah. In fact, in, in, many, in many ways, it is the high point of the year because we spoke already about in the month of Nisan, how it is the time of renewal and how it's the first month of the year, as Hashem tells us, like it's the beginning of time, as we were reading in Exodus 12, but the apex of this month of Nisan is, is Passover, and it's the birth of freedom. Yeah, And yeah. it is absolutely the, the, the beginning of everything was the going out of Egypt, and that's why it's an eternal covenant. Yeah, it was a, it was a new world. It, it, a new world had been introduced. It was like a... Like, uh, you know, the, the Democrats joke about the Great Reset. This really was the Great Reset. And it was the birth of a nation. Um, it was, And it really changed everything for all people because right. it, in, it's really also, the, the, it's the birth of freedom. Mm-hmm. But we really have to, in order to understand that, <clears throat> we really have to understand what they were up against, what um, the land of Egypt's... Um, torture and servitude, what it really represents to us today. And that's really what our program is about today. And I, I must tell you, Jim, first of all, it's always such an honor and privilege to get to have this show with you and to get to share this time with you because you are such a bold iconoclast yourself in terms of your attachment to Hashem and your devotion to Torah and the whole concept of what it means to be a Noahide, what it means to be a God-fearing Gentile. You know that one of the questions that I received a lot in the weeks coming up to Passover was, well, what about the non-Jews who love Hashem? Right. What about the non-Jews who keep Torah to whatever extent? Are they uh, allowed to be at a Passover Seder? <clears throat> Are they allowed to observe Passover? And the reason that there is a lot of confusion, apparently, in, the, in this uh, subject is because apparently there are rabbis who teach that non-Jews have no... Uh, relation to Passover that they ha- that is not applicable to them at all that it, that you know they have no connection, and uh, that's not my position at all or the position of the rabbis that I've been privileged to study under for so many years. On the contrary, uh, I want to take this opportunity to really delve into why Passover is important for the whole world. It may not be the exact same uh, method uh, of 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 observance, but the concept is. Passover is so important to the whole world that it's impossible to ignore. And so this is something that we, we really need to discuss. Well, how should the non-Jewish world observe Passover? But the first thing I would, I would really like to clarify is that it is, it's really imperative for all people who love Hashem, who love Torah, who identify with, the, with the, the destiny of what Israel is supposed to be bringing to the world. Passover is, is absolutely an essential milestone uh, in the life of mankind. Yeah, well, it it restates. You know, we I, I mentioned a, a reset. The, the the event is a restating, a reminding to the whole planet that that there are miracles. You know, you talked about last week that Nisim. You know, the month of, of Nisan is from the root of uh, of Nisim of a, of a Nis- miracle. And really, that's the other thing to me that it represents. It represents the fact that that there is a creator, and that uh, the creator is the uh, the source of all things, of all life, of the miraculous. And the ten plagues was a reminder to those who scoffed at or uh, hated God that there is a God above all gods. And he turned nature's laws on its heads, its head, and um, that's one of the things that brought me to Torah. That, by the way, and the the de- development and the creation of the modern state of Israel. And you know that's that's really funny because they're, they're both obviously are connected. Uh, Passover culminates later at Sinai in the birth of the nation of Israel, God's firstborn. And then in 1948, we have the, the world reminded once again of, of this, this birth of this nation who, whose laws and statutes come from the Torah itself. It's, 
It's your constitution, your bill of rights, your deed to the land of Israel. In fact, this is what I love pointing out to people when I'm, I'm, I've been so blessed to be able to lecture about this, is that the Exodus is the answer that, was, that is given to Abraham Avinu at the covenant of the pieces when, when Abraham says, well, how will I know that this land will belong to, to, to me and to my descendants? And God's answer is, go get me five kosher animals. <laughs> and he sacrifices them. He's shown and he's told by Hashem that your seed from, from I, the birth of Isaac onward, uh, you will experience three or four uh, uh, existential sort of experiences culminating in leaving the country and the nation that uh, subjected you to harsh labors, and you will leave them with great, which, uh, great riches, great wealth. And th all these things are wrapped up in Pesach. And it's also uh, <clears throat> not only that Hashem turned the world on its, on its head, as it were, and superseded nature and showed that he is beyond nature, that he controls the world and, the, and that there are no rules for him, but that that is a process that continues as well. Mm -hmm. But I want to say that I, I think that some of the confusion that a lot of very sincere non-Jewish Torah observant people have about whether or not they're entitled to any stake in the Passover experience, part of the confusion comes from the fact that the truth is that there is a, a, a one solid distinction, and that is the Passover offering. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and, and the Passover offering is indeed an exclusive and, and I would even say an intimate bond between Israel and Hashem. And Hashem says very, very clearly in, in the Torah portion of Bo in chapter 12, where he begins to speak about the Passover offering, that this is only for the circumcised, this is only for Israel. And uh, so, because, so because of that, some people have the impression that, that Passover is off limits, but there's certainly no problem whatsoever with non-Jews attending a, you know, either a Jewish Passover Seder or making a Seder on their own or, do, or, or doing some sort of um, celebration that night to, to mark the miracles of Hashem and appreciation and thanksgiving to Hashem. So, of course, the, the truth is that the Seder that we have on Passover night, which of course Seder means order because order. We, we, uh, we have a standard text, which is the Haggadah. And the Haggadah actually comes from the word to speak, to say over, because the, one of the main concepts of the Passover experience is to speak, is to tell over the praise of Hashem. And the story of the, of the Exodus, in fact, on a, on a deep spiritual level, there's a, as an idea that when the Israelites were in exile in Egypt, like speech itself was in exile. They weren't even able to speak because of the, of the tremendous servitude. And that was one of the aspects of the psychological warfare of, of Pharaoh. They, they, they weren't able to pray. They weren't able to cry out. And that was his goal, to drive a wedge between them and Hashem. But on a deep level, the word, pa the word Pesach, which is translated as Passover, which comes from the idea of, as it were, of Hashem skipping over the houses. Mm -hmm. But Pesach can be seen as a contraction phonetically of the two words pe sach which means a speaking mouth because it's it's all about speaking but but uh, but in a way you know this the seder that we have today which is very beautiful very ceremonial and and a wonderful family gathering or community gathering or even people that make that make their own seder or even if if you're by yourself and you and you make the seder and you go through the whole concept of uh, the text of the Haggadah, which of course is like a springboard for, for us to bring in our own, our own uh, comments and insights as well and, uh, and to speak about the, the miracles of Hashem. The Seder that we have today is really a skeleton of what it's supposed to be. And, and you'll, you'll only hear this from people that are into the temple, that are either temple activists or that are learned about the subject of the temple. Nobody else really seems to care. But the fact is that, first of all, the Passover offering is an eternal covenant, mm -hmm. and it was never, you know, abrogated or canceled or something like that. And it, it's so important that it's it's equated actually with circumcision. In fact, those are those are the two bloods that are they're, referred to yeah, by mixed. that verse in, Eze in Ezekiel. That uh, that uh, it's in Ezekiel chapter sixteen and verse six, where 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 God says, "And I saw you wallowing in your blood." It was the merits of the courage and the dedication of the Jews to fulfill the mitzvah of circumcision as well as the, the, the commandment of the Passover offering 
that uh, mer- that merited them to be able to leave uh, Egypt. But the thing is that, you know, I, I like to put it this way, that the the concept of the Passover offering is like the national circumcision of Am Yisrael, of the nation of Israel. And they're, and they're equal in their importance. And, and that's why it's ironic that we are prevented politically, you know, today from bringing the Passover offering, but, but the concept is still binding upon us. And the, the Passover offering for the people of Israel is the ultimate expression of this commitment to Hashem. Yeah because of everything that it represents, because they, they took one of the gods of the, of the Egyptians. And can you imagine, it was four days before the 14th of Nisan. See, the Passover offering is actually offered on the 14th of Nisan, and then the, the festival begins that night, the, on the, fi- the night of the 15th. But four days before uh, the time of the Passover on the 10th of Nisan, in the beginning of, of uh, chapter 12, we read about how Hashem commanded that the children of Israel should take a take a sheep into the house yeah. and keep it there for four days and watch it. And I'm sure that the Egyptians were incredulous, but at that time they were already they were the Egyptians were already like, when are these people leaving already? Yeah. And they had it had been a year of of the makot of, of the plagues, plagues already. Yeah. And so then they see them taking the sheep into the house and say, "What are you doing?" And the Jews actually stood there and said, "We're going to be slaughtering these animals as an offering to our God." And they were dumbstruck mm-hmm. they were speechless at that kind of holy audacity well by then the symbolism, by then they would have even thought okay i'm not i'm not getting near these people i'm not going to object <laughs> you know we've seen what their god can do so let's well, just where are you going yeah <laughs> so but but the symbolism on so many levels of the passover offering of why it's an eternal covenant is so powerful because that was like the the job description of the children of Israel coming into their own, like, like you know, like you said, they're gonna they're gonna go out to Mount Sinai. They're gonna receive their constitution. They're becoming a nation, and and okay, Hashem is saying, this is what you do in the world: you slaughter the idolatry mm-hmm. of the world before their very eyes. And that, honestly, to me, is the most succinct and beautiful definition of what Jews are supposed to be in this world. We're supposed to stand up for the honor of the one true God. And literally slaughter the idolatry. That's in their DNA. That's 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 uh, that's the exploits of of their of their father Avraham Avinu coming full circle. We all know the right. wonderful story of him, of him tearing up the idols in his father's shop, and and then mocking you know in, in a way and saying, well, that idol over there, he's putting putting the axe in the hands of one of the idols the big that guy. was left standing. <laughs> And said, well, he did it, I didn't, and his father scoffed and said, they can't move, they can't speak. And he says, listen to yourself. So this is, this is um, Israel com- make, completing the circle, you know. Um, you know, it's funny, the, I was just reading about the, um, uh, it's just a little sidebar, this idea of, of completing a circle. You know, this is another name for, for the nation of Israel, the eternal people, you know. Am Olam. And... It, there, there are three, uh, there are three sort of serpents mentioned in the in the Tanakh in Ezekiel and Isaiah. In Ezekiel, Pharaoh is called the great serpent, and then there is there is the idea of the serpent or whatever kind of reptile there was in at the uh, the standoff against the Hatumim, the magicians, and the how Moses and Aaron threw down their their staffs and. They pick them up and they're straight, and the the uh, sometimes in the uh, Kabbalistic literature, uh, Moses is called the straight the the uh, the straight serpent, but in respect to the nation, they are like the serpent that that uh, comes around and swallows its tail. Is that they represent the eternal nature. Of the nation of Israel, um, so I, you know, this is—it's like a standoff of two concepts opposing each other, you know. So, in the days of the Holy Temple, the seder was literally around the Passover offering, mm-hmm. right? Because Passover offering had to be eaten by midnight, and you know the word afikoman. Sure, you hide it. Yeah, you, right. The, the, <laughs> well, the, the matzah that. Uh, Right, the afikoman is a, is the last piece of matzah that's eaten at the seder, and yet there's there's an idea of 
traditionally that in order to get, get the kids very, very excited and to give them more of a role in the Seder and to keep them awake, because it's really a night for, for children. It's very important. And it says in Exodus 13 and verse 8, and you shall tell your child, which also includes ourselves. We tell ourselves, we tell our own inner child, but the, the real aspect of the, of the Seder is to speak over to the family, to the children, to the next generation, because it is eternal, mm-hmm. and to keep the circle going, to tell over what Hashem did for me when he took me out of Egypt to tell the children. So, so one of the uh, exciting things for many children is when the, the father or whoever's hosting the Seder hides the afikoman and the, the kids look for it. But the idea is that the afikoman represents the Passover offering because everyone had a little, a little tiny piece of the Passover offering. And the, the Seder was really... Uh, totally focused on that. So now our Seder is a remembrance, really, of of the time of the Temple and how it was really conducted in a, in a completely different way. And again, we are still commanded to this day to bring the Passover offering, and that's what, we are, that's what we're waiting to do. But in the meantime, the concept of the, of the Seder is still so powerful as a vehicle and a device for us to reach a, a, a beautiful and holy and, and deep level of um, connection to Hashem, because that night is is like a uh, like Hashem breaks through the barriers of time mm-hmm. and uh, extends to all of us the opportunity for each one of us to leave Egypt, and yeah. that's why we have the famous teaching in the Haggadah that uh, uh, if if a person does not see himself as if he personally was taken out of Egypt that night, then he hasn't fulfilled his obligation. And, it's, and it's, it would be a terrible squandering of the chance because Hashem is really giving us a chance that night to leave our own personal Egypt yeah. behind as well, which is something that we really have to, yeah. have to discuss. You've made the point that, that this, this is something that we all, every human being needs to access that, that idea of leaving their own personal Egypt, which, is, which speaks of a... Uh, not only bondage, but bondage to the physic- physicality of the world. You know, the the leeks and garlics of Egypt. You know, I would I would change, I would I would change this this you know habitual behavior of mine if I if I would just leave this Egypt of that, that beckons me every day when I get up because you know the the, the Western world is very very much a, a product of 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 that mindset. The, uh, That's exactly it. What you what you what you're saying. I would leave if I could. Well, when can I? Mm-hmm. Is is really the challenge of of Passover because it, it is um, when we tell over the story of going out of Egypt. What what does it mean that we're supposed to be looking at ourselves and saying, well, you know, uh, if Hashem wouldn't have taken us out, we would still be slaves there today. That that's true. But but why is it that I have to look at it as if Hashem is taking me out right now or else I don't fulfill the, the, the obligation of the evening because really the story is my own personal story. Yeah. It's, the, it's the story of my own personal ups and downs and vicissitudes in dealing with the pharaohs in my life. Because again, as you and I have spoken about this so many times, Mitzrayim literally means constraint. Yeah, concentration. It means like a tight spot. It's the narrow place. Yeah. It, is, it is the straits. And Pharaoh represents all the ne- all the negativity in our within ourselves, and that we confront. It is it is like um, a battle that we that we're going through all the time. You know, uh, we we spoke when we were learning those Torah portions about Pharaoh. We spoke about how he was, you know, engaging in psychological warfare, trying to tr- trying to um, give the people busy work. Just to distract them, you know the the concept of the cities that the Israelites were commanded to build that were self-destructing. You know they they worked all day toiling and building these cities, and then at night they he pushed a button and they and they collapsed so that they saw that their toil was going nowhere and it was so frustrating. And then and the whole thing about the gender dysphobia, dysphobia that he gave women men's work and and men women's work. It was all about sowing the seeds of absolute confusion because the whole idea about about this this uh, pharaoh is that he did not want the people to have a chance to stop and think and pray to Hashem. And that is, so, uh, to me, so much like the world today also, that we're, we're constantly being bombarded with information, with misinformation, with distractions, with challenges, with things that we're supposed to want, 
we're constantly being told what, what we're supposed to aspire to acquire and and we're, you know and we're drowning in the social media of what everybody is having having for breakfast and how everybody's accomplishing so much and it and it is all like one big husk really husk you know the word klipa why the whole experience is so relevant to us today i think for so many people is because you know you, what you could compare it to today what egypt is really all about on the deepest se- secret level that the torah is telling us is like it's all about apostasy jim it's yeah. all about denying hashem it's all it's all <clears throat> understood from the from the famous statement of pharaoh which is his business card his meme his banner on his facebook page Pharaoh's main statement is, who is Hashem? I don't know who he is. Mm-hmm. And that is, is, is also like what we're confronted with every single day. The world is, is fomenting and churning with that level of, of denial. And, and Passover is the very opposite of that. Passover is the confirmation, the beginning of true faith. Yeah. And it also, the, the whole, the Seder experience is something that uh, you know has has uh, happened every year for over three thousand three hundred and some odd years. I don't remember the exact number. I, I haven't done the math, but it would be easy enough to do. Uh, looking at the Hebrew calendar, it, it happened in the the Hebrew year twenty four forty eight, or the, the the Jewish chronology. Uh, basically, thirteen twelve thirteen thirteen on the the secular calendar. But what I appreciate about the Seder is that it reinforces the value of, of, um, of teaching, of, of live physical teaching. We can have the Word, we can have classes, we can have movies, but sitting around the table with your family and, and telling it to your children and allowing them to ask questions, that reinforces that, that the idea of a teacher, of someone teaching Torah to you physically, in your presence, it will never go away. Because this is the, the method that God has chosen every year to remind the Jewish people who they are and who their destiny is. At a table, sitting and speaking to and one And like another. you say, a big part of that experience is asking, mm-hmm. like, what is this all about? And the whole symbolism of the four different types of right. personality types, the first sons, that are, that are really all of us we have... At times we have moments that we don't understand anything. At times there are moments we, have, we think we have all the answers. At times yeah. there are, we have moments where we think, what's the difference? And, 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 and the whole idea of encouraging, questioning, meaning that we don't know everything. Mm-hmm. You know, the whole, the whole Some of the most outrageous of, questions I've ever heard about Torah have been at a Seder table. <laughs> I'll never forget. I'm going to share this with you. I was at a, Carol and I were a friend um, at their table with the family and everything. We loved being there, and they had some, they had some friends that uh, they didn't see very often. And I remember this one person almost whining, just in the middle of us discussing the ideas and, and the the uh, the reality of the of of the Egyptian exile. And they were asking me, you know, what I knew from my research and all that. And this one person goes. Why did God kill all those innocent Egyptian uh, firstborn, those babies? And I, I was like, what? You know, and I, I was, you know, taken aback because this person was, was uh, you know, and of course Hashem was not happy with that. He, he's, right. Hashem, because, you know, we're all God's children. But, he, but I, all, I, when I recovered from the question and the whole character of the question I said well first of all they most of them were were not infants uh, there there were the firstborn that did but most of them were were you know grown men and, and you know and uh, in fact there was even a civil war that broke out it, it's it's uh, mentioned uh, Rashi mentions it in in Psalms that uh, when it says that uh, God slew uh Egypt through through their firstborn, and Rashi talks about the fact that a civil war broke out. But the other thing was, I said, I said, well, what about all the 
Israelite children that we know were babies that were thrown in the Nile. We know that. There weren't any adults thrown into the Nile. They were all infants, you know. And I, I w that shook me up for the rest of the Seder, you know, because we, because we run into this today. It, it, it's still relevant today. It is, is the people that kill you or try to kill you daily, if they suffer from their attempts, the media in the world, I'm sorry, I'm not, I don't want to get political, but I'm just a little bit here. They ask about the, the perpetrator of the crime. They're concerned more with them than they are with, with the death of an innocent Jew in Israel today. Okay, let's get back to the, to the, the um, I didn't want to take us too off course here. Moving right along. <laughs> Moving right along. So. There's another, another concept that is, um, that is preeminent in the whole scope of the Passover experience. We spoke about the Passover offering, how it's an eternal covenant, how important it is, because it's, a, it's really a statement of the, our commitment to Hashem, of our, of our commitment to uh, break down the idolatry of the world and to stand up for Hashem. Uh, and on that level of, of, the, of, like of the sealing of the covenant with the people of Israel, that, that original Passover offering in Egypt yet, and again, I want to emphasize, you know, the, the, the important idea that I want to begin with, the, fa the fact that I'm not only encouraging, but I'm, I'm suggesting strongly that all people um, participate somehow in, in, a, in, a, in a, um, a celebration of the recognition of, of Hashem's compassion and, and, and kindness and, and divine providence on that night, because it is a, it is a night that it is propitious to launch a person into into a new level and to leave personal constraints behind and to and to really start all over again. It's a it's a very powerful portal to um, to for change and for saying to Hashem, you know, what? Why do you have me in the world? What is the purpose of my soul? What 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 can I do in this world? It's like a whole new beginning. So it's, it's definitely something that has a, a very universal aspect. And you know what it's like also, Jim, what it reminds me of? You and I have spoken about the concept that the Sabbath as well, Shabbat, is relevant to the non-Jewish world as it is to Israel, although there are kind of like two different levels, two different dimensions, because the Jewish people are commanded to keep a very specific Shabbat in terms of refraining from creative activity, right? Mm -hmm. The 39 different types of creative activity. And that is this concept of Shabbat, which is an intimate kind of like a ceiling uh, between the people of Israel and Hashem. The the observance of Shabbat, according to Halakha, is not obligatory on other people. Right. But yet there is another aspect to Shabbat, which is, you know, Shabbat is, has two names. It's called the Sabbath, and it's called the seventh day. And this is a, a, a deep understanding that I received from my, my holy mentor, Rabbi Yolo Schwartz of Blessed Memory, who just passed away, I think it was last year. Mm -hmm. And he emphasizes very much in his writings that you know, there is the concept of Shabbat, which is a, a very idiosyncratically Jewish thing, right? Like, and again, the word uh, uh, almost intimate between Hashem and the people of Israel. But yet, there is the seventh day, which is a universal day of rest. And he was very emphatic about the fact that the non-Jewish world that loves Hashem and that loves Torah and that aligns with Israel should most certainly observe the seventh day as well, not necessarily a, 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 in the same manner that the Jewish people are responsible for for observing in terms of the halachic ramifications, but certainly marking it as a day of prayer and a joyful time with family and reflection and study and contemplation and and celebrating Hashem's renewal of the creation of the world every week. Yeah. So Shabbat is also absolutely, and, and every time I'm asked about the relationship between Noahides and Shabbat, I, I'm, I'm most uh, emphatic that they should certainly identify with Shabbat as well. So the same idea here with Passover is that, you know, it's, it is an opportunity for all people to reconnect with their own potential to be reborn. And it's, a, it, it's, really, the, it's really the, you know, today, speaking of politics, which we won't, everybody's talking about freedom, 
various types of freedom, right? And of course, the way that freedom is, de is defined today in our WW woke worlds, right? The way it's defined today is not at all the way Torah defines freedom, because freedom is, is understood by most people as being like, I'll do whatever the heck I want. And you can't stop me. I can do whatever I want, whenever I want. That's not what freedom means in, in Torah. Freedom in Torah means that we have the ability to rise above, the opposite, to, to rise above like the hubris and ego and self-gratification and living for myself alone. And we have the freedom to be able to, be, to really um, hone the divine image in which we were created and to serve others. But in any event, the idea is that, that the, the Passover experience and, the, and, the, and especially the Seder night, the whole concept is life-giving for all people because it's an opportunity to, to really celebrate freedom. It's the birthday of freedom for all people. I started to say an another aspect of Passover that is very um, specific about this festival, you know, <clears throat> is the, I, I mentioned as soon as we began about that, you know, the exhausting preparations that lead up to Passover, <clears throat> because we have this idea of uh, removing all leaven from our, from our possession, chametz, that which rises, right? So first of all, God tells us very specifically, uh, in uh, chapter 12 of, of Exodus, for a seven-day period shall you eat matzo, but on the previous day you shall nullify the leaven from your homes. For anyone who eats leavened food, that soul shall be cut off from Israel from the first day to the seventh day. This is a very, very serious idea, uh, the spiritual excising. You know, the, the laws pertaining to chametz, to leavened food on Passover, are more stringent yeah. than the ordinary laws of kashrut, of, of, of keeping kosher. Yeah. When it comes to leaven, it is like, whoa, it is like, it is super, super turbo nuclear, the enemy. You know, and of course, in the time of the Holy Temple, when the Passover offering is brought, one, one cannot have any leaven in their possession. And even now, this again is an eternal covenant that, you know, we spend a lot of time before Passover just absolutely turning the house upside down. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, some people uh, kind of blur the distinction between Passover cleaning and spring cleaning, you know, but, but rust and, and old uh, rocking chairs and portraits from hundreds of years ago uh, that are in the attic <laughs> and all the things that one always wanted to get rid of, you know, you can do that before Passover if you want, but it's a lot of extra work. That's not what this is about. Again, people have a, a problem like, cutting it off where it goes exactly. But, but the truth is that Passover cleaning is not spring cleaning. Passover cleaning is that we want to take all the utensils that we've used for ordinary cooking all throughout the year, and there are various methods of, of making them kosher for Passover, depending on if it's the sink or the refrigerator or the oven, how, what we have to do to cleanse it and purify it so that it can now be used for Passover because the stringency, which is very holy, and a very, very praiseworthy attribute. The stringency is so specific that we, we want to distance ourselves from any leaven whatsoever. That's why even foods that are kosher all year round have to be especially kosher for Passover to make sure that they you know, weren't uh, involved with any, with any leaven whatsoever. And of course, we read about the matzot that are eaten on the night of the Seder, are special matzot. They're not the ordinary matzot that most people eat the rest of the week because we read in chapter 12 and verse 17, you shall safeguard the matzot for on this very day I have taken your legions out of the land of Egypt. And in Hebrew, it's, it's actually, you shall watch the, the matzot. And that's this idea that the, the, the flour that's used to make the, the, the matzot for the Seder night, the, the, the wheat is actually watched from the moment that it's cut all throughout the process until it's actually in the box, it was watched so that it, it could be absolutely certain that it never come, came in contact with water and there was absolutely no possibility whatsoever, even a minuscule possibility that it would be able to rise and the machinery that's used to, to bake matzot is disassembled and reassembled, cleaned every 18 minutes in between the cycles so that it, the matzah remains totally... And, wh and where does all this come from? This tremendous... Yes, obsession is the word. It's Hashem's obsession. But you see, that it's Hashem's yeah. obsession because He says this is, this is how serious it is. And so this is translated into, into a flurry of uh, just absolute, uh, you know, uh, thorough, careful uh, examination and cleansing before the festival. Where does it all come from? 
You know, so ostensibly it just comes from the simple verse. You know, I read one verse, which is that Hashem says, for a seven-day period you shall eat matzot and you shall nullify the leaven. That means we can't even own any in our possession. Not only can we not eat it, and but also it comes from the idea that they left in such a hurry that they were carrying their dough on their on their shoulders because it hadn't had a chance to rise. And and those are are the simple, you know, ostensibly the. The, the, the parts of the story and the commandment, but the deeper level is, again, how this is supposed to affect us, how it's supposed to affect our heart, how it's supposed to have bearing on our relationship to Hashem and our desire to be the best people that we can be, because the, the whole concept here is that matzah is without ego. Mm-hmm. It's flat. Yeah. It's absolutely one-dimensional, and, it's, and it's, it has no... Um, it's it doesn't get very very uh, full of itself. Right? It's not in, <laughs> but, but the ego but, isn't inflated, right? Yeah. Exactly. But but the whole concept of of leaven and and rising literally that's what we say about a person also that's full of himself that mm-hmm. he yeah. you know he he kind of like lifts himself above other people, and so and so. What this is really telling us is that the Passover experience, in order to be able to leave our Egypt behind, in order to be able to be taken out by Hashem. It requires our humility. And, and the way that I like to liken it, the metaphor, you know, the Kabbalists always talk about the idea of the, a vessel and light. You know, they have to, there's a vessel that holds the light. Hashem's light is infinite, but there has to be a vessel to hold it. It's like that with everything, and that metaphor in, in, in the world of Torah, because if, if we want to receive Hashem's blessing, if we want to be able to contain what he's giving us, the light that he's giving us, you have to have a vessel, yeah. right? It's like, it's like the, the beautiful story in the book of Kings uh, uh, with uh, Elisha and the widow and the oil. You know, she had one, one jar cru- of cruise, oil, yeah. one, one cruise of oil, and she had, she had no money to pay the landlord, and he was going to take her children away. And, but because she, she said she had one cruise of oil, then Elisha said, bring more and more and more vessels, and it kept pouring more and right. more and more. And so, uh, so too, when we want to receive Hashem's blessing, first of all, we have to empty ourselves out, right. because, because you know, the, the idea of our our desire to receive for ourselves is what the Kabbalah calls it. Like we're very, very self-centered as people. We're we're very, very ego-driven. That comes from eating of the tree of knowledge. You know, it's all about me. I want to be God. I want to know everything. I, wa- I, I you know, I want to be I want to be in charge here. So we empty that out, light the matzah, right? And we create a vessel so that we can hold what Hashem wants to give us. And, and the vessel that we create is the whole experience of, of getting ready for Passover. Because as we're scouring the corners of, of, of the refrigerator, I was telling, telling our friends in our Zoom class, like everything that we go through to clean the refrigerator, uh, there's something weighing in the back that I thought we ate like six months ago, and it's just been left there. So, you know, we have to clean the refrigerator very, very well, clean everything, clean the, the oven with the blowtorch and all the things that we have to do. And I have to be thinking to myself the whole time, it's not enough to clean the, the, the outer house. I have to clean the inner house also. Right. I have to scour the deepest corners and recesses where, where I don't usually go, where I don't usually think about that, I, that, I'm, that I'm usually avoiding it. And I have to get in there with that brush, and I have to face it, and I have to burn it. I have to destroy it before Passover. And I, and I have to start over again from the point where I can receive Hashem's light and get out. Amen. Yeah. And and uh, I have a I have a quick question. I'm curious. Do you use uh, uh, shmira matzah? Yeah, that's the matzah that I'm talking about. Right. That's right. the special matzah know, that's washed. I was just reading about that, and that they are. Th- this I think is a good sign. There's more being produced th- than ever before by the, the, the people whose business is to make matzah. There's, there, the demand for shmirah, this authentic matzah, is on the rise, and it's gotten up to the point where they're making, they're, they're using millions of pounds of flour at Passover time now around the world, all of the shops that, that, that deal in this. And, um, and it, for those who don't, don't know, it's, it's very authentic looking, of course. It's, it's round, 
and and or at least the the the, the shimmero matsu that I have is round. Right. And there is some is made by hand. Those mm-hmm. are the large round ones, and yeah. some is made by machine. And that's that's as I was describing. Right. The machine is is very very scrupulously uh, monitored and cleaned and taken apart and put back together again. Yeah, I've seen and the I've seen the videos. They're fascinating. You find them on YouTube. All the trouble they go to to make this special this special brand. I remember my first uh, Pesach after recognizing that I was a Noachide and my first trip to Israel. And I remember how startling it was to find, uh, and it was, it was a, I, I saw it as very um, ennobling of, of everyone and everything I saw in Israel, even, even the commercial enterprises in, in Israel uh, at, at that time were very careful about um, if they had chametz. Even I, I remember they, uh, there was a brand new pizza hut uh, over near Ben Yehuda Street, and and uh, Passover week, their pizzas were made on matzah. Because you know you you know a pizza crust is a very you know definitely something you make with yeast. Because but, God forbid a week should go by and you can't have pizza. <laughs> so yeah. I mean there are people that just have to have their pizza. Okay, so they'll have yeah. matzah pizza. I think I think they I think that they the first year they did it because I never, remember coming back later. And they would just close for Passover, and they they probably found out that that they weren't being scrupulous enough, you know, and and uh, to to make sure that they weren't, you know, that there wasn't water introduced or whatever. And I remember the other thing I remember too is I was uh, is I was at a I was in um, uh, Male Adum, uh, Adumim, this beautiful large community right outside of Israel, and. Uh, I went to wash my car, and the line of cars, I'd forgotten it was, it was right before Passover. And, and uh, it, it surprised me that, that uh, here, here were my Jewish friends lined up, even making sure there wasn't comets in their car, you know, from, from snacking in their cars or whatever. Yeah, because a person is responsible to, to go through every uh, their, item in their possession. And if, if a person works in an office mm-hmm. and then they have their home and every place that they possibly have been in that they are responsible for, including their car, all has to be scoured of chametz. Yeah, and it shows you that, that Hashem, you know, I mean, he, he created us so he understands what we require to... to Always be reminded. There's so many aspects of of uh, observance in the Torah that have a a mnemonic aspect to them. It's like like the seat seat and and this, like you're talking about all these things that you're thinking about when you're going through the corners of the house and everything. Um, it's it's a reinforcement, and the whole idea of the seder anyway is that that annual remembrance. I don't want you to forget this. I don't want you to forget where you came from and who you are, and and um, and and the and the mission that I've set before you and that you accepted at Sinai is that you would. It's all connected: the Passover offering and the experience yeah. of the Seder. And I and I think that one of the things that this this amazing prohibition of leaven really drives home, as as a basis of Passover, is the danger of ego. Mm-hmm. And how it's really the basis of everything. And, you know, we learn in Mesilat Yisharim of the Ramchal and other holy works how of all the attributes, you know, the attribute of haughtiness is man's downfall. And it's really the root of all negative traits. And Passover is like exactly the opposite of that. Yeah. Um, you and I had a great Seder together a few years ago. It was you, great. You came to our, it was our family Seder. It was, uh, it was a bit... Um, I, I, that's when I learned. Uh, that's when I learned that you have a, a, a bit of a theatrical nature to you. And <laughs> that's when you learn, not from our, our everyday no, it interaction. No, was, it was. It was. Uh, finally uh, sealed. It sealed the deal. This this man loves to perform. I thought, <clears throat> and of course the children. That, that was. It was delightful because um, I, I I can never forget you out there in front of all the children. At, and we had a. It was a big seder. Yes. I mean, we had like a U-shaped table to accommodate everyone, and all the children were delighted. And you were, you were, you had a, a cloak on and a staff, and you were this old man. And um, <laughs> not that there's anything wrong with that, 
But <laughs> no, now I, now I wouldn't have to act anymore. Then I'm an old man. Yeah, right. And you, you, with each with each of the description of the plagues of the the, the strikes, <clears throat> you, you uh, I remember the plague of the frogs. They were throwing little miniature frogs at you. Anyway, it was delightful, and and uh, and again, it served to reinforce in me the memory of of that occasion uh, in, in a very fond way, and yeah. it. Uh, that's why I love the fact that we're talking about this because I, I, you know, if you if you're if you're not Jewish and you've got some Jewish neighbors or friends, kind of hint like, you know, do you have enough room at Can your I come? table? <laughs> you know, try to go to and again the, the standard text that that traditionally we've used for so long the Haggadah. There's a, there are definitely versions that are available online, and mm-hmm. there are literally hundreds and hundreds of different editions with different commentaries and beautiful insights. And that can be also like a springboard for people to expand in their own creative way. And the main thing really is, like I said, Pesach, a speaking mouth, to give it over, Mm -hmm. to give it over to the children, to give it over to ourselves, to make it exciting for the children. And... um, It it does, it turns, it, it turns over, it sort of elevates the idea. Again, this is one of those things where we're coming back full circle. Uh, the, the Jewish people were put into bondage by the dictates of the mouth of Pharaoh, Perach, a soft speaking right. mouth. That's how the whole thing started with the Perach. Exactly. With the, with the that turned into such tremendous affliction. But first, he started saying, "Oh, I'll help you. Let's do yeah. it together." Right. And no, Passover brings that idea back, but it's a different mouth speaking. It's a mouth speaking words of Torah and of thanks and praise, and it completely sort of elevates that idea uh, and, and puts a nice uh, dot at the end of the, the epic sentence that we call Exodus. But all the Chagim, you know, and you keep talking about circle, you know, the eternal people and the circle of life and that whole thing. You know, the amazing thing is that Chag, which is a festival, actually means a circle. Ah. The Amen. word itself means to, means, re, really means a circle. And it's the cycle of time, but it's without borders, you know, because Hashem actually is, is breaking the barriers of time. It becomes eternal. That's why, that's why Passover is called an eternal covenant. Mm-hmm. And I think that, again, whether a person is Jewish or non-Jewish, there's so much that we can relate to because... The whole idea of going out, and, and again, I have to say it again because it's so important for people to, to feel welcome and to feel that they are empowered and that it is necessary, each in our own way, Jews and Gentiles, to, to mark that night and to uh, use that night as a, as a springboard for change because the because make no mistake the purpose of the festivals is not for us to just simply live it up and celebrate but to change it's to change us and the whole thing about the egypt that we are escaping and you know, there's a beautiful midrash and you know that you and i always talk about how the midrashim are poetic um, vehicles to to convey deep ideas they're not literal right so there's a there's a midrash that says that you know egypt was so um totalitarian, you know, it was it was like the slavery that the Israelites were subjected to in Israel was so serious that the Midrash says no one ever escaped from Egypt. No slave ever escaped from Egypt before. It was like super duper reinforced prison camp that no one could ever leave. But again, what does that really mean? It's it's an idea that everything that that narrow place represents is despair and uh, hopelessness. And that's why it's so important for us to understand that Hashem is opening and opening for us because, again, we, we are... This is why, in, in, a, in a nutshell, I, wanna, I just want to proclaim and, and really, like, from my heart, like, tell everyone what, where this is going, why this is so relevant to everyone because, the, again, the, the husk of Egypt... It's all about denial of Hashem. Pharaoh's statement that I don't, I don't know who Hashem is. And that's exactly what the biggest challenge is today. And Jim, do you know that there's like, what is it, like over 40 times in the Torah that uh, our bondage in the land of Egypt is, is mentioned, right? Mm-hmm. 
And Hashem says over and over and over again in the Torah, I am Hashem, your God, who took you out of the land of Egypt. That became like so uh, fundamental, so paramount in our consciousness forever that every single day we mention it at least twice a day in the Shema. We mention it in the Grace After Meals every single day. The tefillin that we wear that are so holy, the purpose of it is to remind us that Hashem took us out of Egypt and every moment that we're wearing it, we're supposed to be remembering that Hashem took us out of Egypt. Why? Why is that so important? Why is it, why is it so important that on Friday night, when we sanctify Shabbat, which is the holiest moment of the week, when we, over the wine, we usher in the Sabbath, and in the words of the Kiddush, we recite the words that the Sabbath is a remembrance of the going out of Egypt. Yeah. That, that, that the very creation of the world itself is like on parallel. It's like, it's like there are two uh, watershed events, the creation of the world and the going out of Egypt. Yeah. And they're absolutely parallel events. because So one reason on a simple level is because, well, there was nobody around at the creation of the world to, to give testimony, you know, to bear witness that it's true. And, and millions and millions of people left Egypt and across the Red Sea, and, and the whole world was aware of it. But there's another reason that why they're so, they're so um, uh, parallel, why they're so connected. Because everything that happened at the creation of the world was validated and even, and even surpassed in the exodus from Egypt, because what happened with the creation of the world? Hashem said in the beginning, the word breshit, and brought forth all of the powers of creation and all of the different elements, and then with all of the ten utterances, he he categorized everything and separated everything. But and and they were like that's when he actually kind of like uh, established the laws of nature. Mm-hmm. But when Hashem took the the people of Israel out of Egypt, he broke all the laws of nature. Right. And exactly. he proved that he is that that there are no rules whatsoever, and so the two of them, like bookends, like the creation of the world, which Hashem celebrated on Shabbat, and the going out of Egypt, they're like a set because the, the because because the going out of Egypt teaches us things about the creation of the world that we never even would have known or, or understood yeah. about Hashem's uh, Hashem's. Uh, uh, not not being bound by his own rules, as it were, about yeah. about he about him being the supersession of of nature altogether. Yeah, it's a, it's also it's also another uh, a sanctification of space and time. It's that also because as as I I interrupted myself because I I didn't finish my original thought. I was I was expressing about the fact that when the Torah tells us that they marched out. On the this the very day of Egypt, four hundred thirty years to the day, the if you if you count back in the chronology of of the people of Israel in Seder Haolam, four hundred thirty years prior to the marching out of Egypt, the very same day is the day of the covenant between the pieces. That's when God was. That's when God told Avraham Avinu that your descendants will be in a land that is not theirs, that they will be oppressed, and that those that oppress them, I will judge them, and you will come out with great riches. And what's so important about that, that is the answer, that's God's answer to Avraham when Avraham says, how will I know that this land belongs to me? God says, because the experience of the Exodus and all of the things that you went through is what prepares and actually puts you in a place where you're worthy to live in the land that I have created for you. And it also reinforces the idea, the very real idea, that that Israel is a place. It's not only a people, but it's a place and a nation, not a religion, and that the... the, um, the support of the aspect of Israel being a nation is that that is a central idea of what makes a nation is a collection of people under a government and they have their own country. And God is in essence sanctifying that and saying, I'm taking you back to the holiest place on the earth to bring the holiest nation on the earth because that's where creation began was in, was in what we today call Eretz Israel. It's a, it's a fascinating thing when you think about it. 
it's you know what you're saying about the connection to Abraham Avinu and and everything that his children had to go through that he already received in prophecy of the covenant between the the portions. So in Exodus 12, it's it we read in verse 41. It was at the end of 430 years, and it was on that very day. On that very day, yeah. Which is exactly what you what you're speaking about. That all the legions of Hashem left the land of Egypt. And, and that's why this night, the verse continues, verse 42, it says here in the art school translation, it is a night of anticipation yeah. for Hashem to take them out of the land of Egypt. But in Hebrew, it's called Leil Shimurim, which means a night of watching. And, and again, just again, just translating this into uh, something that can be relevant for, for everyone that's listening and watching, Hashem calls it a night of anticipation. And that's why it's so important for all people to find a way of plugging into this and expressing the de- and making a vessel to hold that light and expressing the desire to want to be responsive to, to what Hashem wants to give us and to be able to leave behind everything that we've known before, all our slavery, all our ego, the leaven, and all of the fear and vulnerability of having been in the place of, of denial and apostasy and the narrow place and how this can become literally for every single person the Rosh Hashanah of Emunah, the new year of faith, a new beginning for every, for every person. I have to tell you the most amazing thing that I just shared recently uh, with, with one of our Zoom classes is such an amazing idea. If you go back to Genesis for a minute, Jim, to the very, very, very beginning of creation, there's such an unbelievable idea here, you know. We read on the at the beginning of the fourth day in Genesis one. So in verse fourteen, we read that that uh, God said, "Let there be luminaries in the firmament, in the firmament of heaven, to divide between day and night, and between, and let them be for signs and for festivals, and for years and for, and for days and for years." So there's a very excellent question on this verse. What is the question? What festivals? Right. <laughs> this, is, this is nothing here. Yeah. It's absolute chaos. Hashem is bringing forth everything into creation. And he says, let these luminaries be for festivals. Right. But there aren't any festivals. There aren't any people. There aren't any, anything to celebrate. What is that even talking about? And it's so powerful because the idea is that it's basically foreshadowing. Mm-hmm. What we read in Leviticus uh, 23, where Hashem said to Moshe, speak to the children of Israel and tell them, these are the festivals of Hashem. So it's, it's foreshadowing that, and it's basically showing us that from the time that Hashem brought forth creation, He, he, he incorporated into the very fabric of creation that these festivals would be would be part of would be part of creation, and even more so. It, it even shows us that this was the purpose of of the luminaries altogether was to mark the festivals. So, in other words, th- these days, why are they so holy? Why do we make such a big deal about them? Because they are literally like, I don't know they're, how to describe it. They're not as not as road markers, not as guideposts. They're, but they're milestones in time. Y- y- and and they and they they offer a person the possibility of breaking through the barriers because that's what Hashem is doing here. Mm-hmm. This, this is why this that verse shows us that the fact that the festivals are rooted in in creation, pre-Adam even, mm-hmm. shows us that Hashem is Himself breaking the barriers of of years and and days and making it eternal. Amen. It becomes like an eternal process. It's such a such a powerful idea. Yeah, and it and it also um, f- it reminds us that uh, of of the Hazal of the sages telling us that there were certain things that were created at the twilight of creation, uh, and it, some of them even figure into the the Exodus narrative. Wasn't the wasn't the rod supposed to have been created? Or am I mixing that up with? Oh, something? the the mouth of the donkey of Milam and the well and the, the well of, of the Miriam a and hole for Korach, uh, and 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 all these items because um, I always think it's fascinating because the first time I read that in in the commentary, like he created the well, just for one example, he created the 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 fissure, the mouth that would open up, you know, 
that was created then. And then it, it, it takes you back because it reminds you of the majesty of the creation that Hashem would form the globe and, and everything on it, the continents and the, the plate tectonics and everything, and yet this fissure was created so that by the time, it was like, it's like a clock ticking, and by the time that Moshe and, and all the children of Israel arrived at that point in the desert, it was ready for, the, the earth was ready to open up at that particular moment, you know. Wow. And it's, it's like the splitting of the sea, you know, in uh, I've I've often explained that there are there are laws, there are physical laws uh, that could would allow for the splitting of the sea. And some people say, well, you're taking away the miraculous nature, and I and I think, well, not really, because the the idea is is that if if we can explain how the sea was split. It doesn't take away from the majesty of the event because for me, first of all, it's immaterial. But if that is the question, the idea that Moshe and this multitude were standing at that particular spot on the shores of the sea when the sea split, that in itself is quite miraculous. Someone told them to be there at that time, you know. Speaking of which, I'm so glad that you brought that up. Before we run out of time, you know, um, the splitting of the sea took place on the seventh night of Passover. Amen. Yeah. And so it took them a week to get get to that point. And the seventh the seventh day of Passover, of course, outside of Israel, there are eight days. That's another issue altogether, that calendrial issue. But the seventh day of Passover, which is which is the bookend of of holiness, the first and the seventh day, that's the the time of leaving Egypt behind for good and, and the splitting of the sea. It's also a very, very powerful time in, in holiness for every person. Um, again, it's, it's the metaphor of birth. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like the birth canal, like walking through the sea to the, to the other side, to the rest of our lives. Yeah. But I want to ask you, since we, we have you here, and this is really part of your expertise, the Egyptian archaeology, what can you tell us? What, do, what, is, what are your positions regarding where this took place exactly, at what, at what particular point it took place, and can you share some of your archaeological knowledge and findings with us regarding the splitting of the sea? Well, you know, the, when, you know we the location. Were, when, when you told me that we were going to be d- doing this particular show for, for uh, preparing for Passover, I mean, I, I knew we would, but we, we kind of arbitrarily discussed what we might talk about. I had actually prepared a PowerPoint, which I'm not going to pull up because it would take us another hour for that PowerPoint. But the 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 title of it, and I might even save it for a, a, a future live lecture. The title of it was uh, uh, "Popular Misconceptions About the Exodus," and there are several that I wanted to address. But one of them is a, a popular, very well-known misconception. That the idea is that the uh, the children of Israel crossed the Sea of Reeds at the Gulf of Aqaba, and I, I'm I'm always ready to tell people that if you believe in Torah and if you know your Torah at least a little bit, that is that is that denies the words of the Torah, because the Torah gives you actual uh, geographic points of reference to describe the splitting of the sea. By the way, a moment ago I mentioned that there are physical laws that that uh, are in place. Uh, there is a, a phenomena called a blowout tide, which has been witnessed even in this country in the springtime, and that's a freak storm, a freak blizzard in April was recorded in this country years ago, and I have the I have the article that speaks of it, and it's about the wind blowing all night. Uh, over a body of water, like a lagoon, a shallow body of water, freezing, pushing the water up and, and creating dry ground and freezing it on the sides. And, okay, again, is, is it not a miracle that, that God split the sea? Yes, but there is another aspect that the Egyptians were familiar with this body of water, and they may have seen this phenomena at one time, not in the spectacular nature that we see it described in not only in the Torah, but also in, in the, uh, by Hazal. So the, the 
the possibility of it was there. Um, but but when it came back, but when it came back in, it was powerful enough. Powerful enough to, to, drown, to drown the, the whole Egy- army. It, it, you know, it drowned the Egyptian, an entire Egyptian army. And and there, it's, it's, they, I know you're not you're not in any way attempting to denude the miraculous aspect of no, it I'm, by plugging I'm, it into I'm scientific being very fact, much which about is, it because it's, when, again, you, it's, when you read, it's very beautiful. This is part of the but conversation saying, wait, you th- that you hear at the seder table is the majesty right. of this event of how and the, and the, again it was it was what six hours mm-hmm. that the seabed was dry and that the, wa- the and that the water literally stood in as as solid walls right it was frozen which is a lot of people don't realize the text of the the Hebrew text actually is a word yes. that is very much like our word congealed it was frozen on the sides and and Israel uh, and I believe in fact it, literally the, ver- the verse literally says that Hashem froze the depths froze the depths and that Israel walked through in 12 different rows. And they made like an ark, uh, like a, they inscribed a semicircle as they, wa- as they entered the sea and came out. And the question is, as you just p- put it to me, is where did this happen? Uh, we, we know it happened on the seventh day because this has been celebrated for thousands of years. And my pet peeve is that there is a popular misconception that it was in the Gulf of Aqaba. And this is proposed by a, a late uh, preacher who took it upon himself to to go looking for objects? He even claimed he'd found the Ark of the Covenant, and and uh, and actually saw blood on it, uh, the uh, the blood of. I, Je- I know who you're talking about. Yeah. I don't want to mention his name. We're not going to mention his name, but and, anyway, he's and, the main proponent of this, and people have taken this up. And I've even met Jews who've read it and said, "Have you seen this?" And I say, first of all, go back to your Torah because the Torah tells us that when they marched into the sea, it was on the seventh day, so that means they had to get to the shores of the of the Sea of Reeds by a minimum by the sixth day, right? Because they were there all night as the wind blew all night. So they had to get there at least by six days, and all of the Jewish sources available to us in, in the oral tradition, in other books such as uh, uh, Seder HaOlam and Sefer HaYashar tells us that they got there probably on the fifth day, and that was when that the Egyptian contingent that was sent along with them said, you're supposed to come back. Three days have passed. And they said, uh, well, your Pharaoh said he didn't want to see our face again. And so they go back and they tell Pharaoh, and then Pharaoh and his army, they, they uh, uh, you know, hitch up their chariots and they pursue Israel. So the point is, is that for, for people to believe that Aqaba is where they, they crossed is an impossibility for several reasons because it denies the scripture which tells us that when they crossed the Sea of Reeds and came out on the shore, they came out into the wilderness of Shur. And there are, I, I always have to write these, these verses down because I, I, um, um, I never remember all of them. In fact, Exodus 15.22 tells us that Israel journeyed from the Yom Suf into the wilderness of Shur. And we're told this also in Numbers 33.8. And the, the other descriptions we have of it is that, in fact, they say that, it, that this occurred, the, 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 the people who don't know their Torah and who cannot read it in English and understand it, say that it happened at the Straits of Tehran, which is a narrow strait, uh, uh, at the tip of the Gulf of Aqaba. And um, the, the problem with that is, is that if you look at a, if you look at, go to Google Earth, and I was going to put this up on my computer and I forgot to, I have the map, go to Google Earth and go to the Sinai Peninsula, find the Straits of Tehran, find the Nile Delta, which is where the eastern Nile Delta is where Am Israel, where the people of Israel were living before they made the exodus out of Egypt. If you draw, you can, on Google Earth, you can draw a line, and the line will tell you, there's a tool that tells you how far it is from point A to point B. And if you draw a line to the Straits of Tehran, you've already gone well over, uh, you've gone about 250 miles. And for them, for Israel, for millions of Israelites, we know at a minimum, two million at a minimum at least, um, when, you, when you're asking them to march 250 miles in six days, it's an impossibility. And I'll, and I'll quote 
a couple of historical sources to, to make my point. And one of them is the, the, um, the I, I, and I mentioned this before, by the way, in, in these podcasts, and that is, is that uh, the, uh, the army of um, Alexander the Great is recorded to have traveled 150 miles when they marched down to Pelusium, when they, when they were on their way to, to Egypt. And the, the historical sources tell us that that 150-mile trip took them a week, and it was, and he was called. He he was known to have the fastest army in antiquity, and it took them a week to march 150 miles. So a week for the fastest army in antiquity to march 150 miles. You're asking an army the size of well, we know the army of of Israel. The armies marched out. It says in one translation, on uh, at the the beginning of the Exodus. They marched out. We know there was a minimum of 600,000 men, and then all of their wives, children, grandmothers, uncles, aunts, you're asking them to march almost twice as far in six days, all right? And the other thing is is that, that, that the shore wilderness, the word shore means a wall. And the reason it was called a wall ever since antiquity is because the only part of Egypt that needed a wall was the eastern frontier. And so that whole region just north of the Gulf of Suez is the ancient Shur wilderness. When you, when you cross the Straits of Tehran, you're now in Saudi Arabia, which was ancient Edom, or at least nearby. But it's also near ancient Midian, and so they didn't march. It doesn't tell us in the Torah that they, they entered the sea and, and marched into Midian because it took, your, it took your ancestors, according to the Torah, 45 days to even get to the wilderness of Sinai. When they left on the, when they left on the 15th of Nisan and they arrived there at the beginning of the first day of the third month, that's 45 days on the Hebrew calendar. So there's all so what these, is your suggestion? I'm sorry, go ahead. What is, what is your suggestion for where, for where the location was? Well, every indicator that I've seen, including the consensus among all of the biblical sages, of the, of the Jewish sages of Hazal, is that it was a point somewhere on the northern end of the Gulf of Suez. And this is, it, it, by the way, this is consistent with the idea of the fact that the, the body of water that they marched through was relatively shallow, um, but it wasn't shallow enough. It had to be deep enough to create these massive walls that would melt immediately and come crashing down on the armies of the Egyptians and drown all of them and pull them to the, the, body of, uh, to the bottom of the sea and drown them. But the point is that, that I'm going to, you know what, if you're going to give me a, uh, the idea of listening to a, a gentleman who claimed he found the Ark of the Covenant, who claimed he found the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, who on and on and on, and he claims that, that they crossed at the Straits of Tehran and claims he found a chariot wheel, which for some reason has been left there on the seabed. If it's such a prize, why leave it? And it's, it, by the way, it wasn't a wheel. It was either, it was either something called fan coral when you, but when you look at fan coral, it looks like a wheel laying on its side with an axle. That's exactly what it looks like. And the other thing is, is, that, is that the Gulf of Aqaba is known to be a, a, a burial ground, if you will, of, of uh, sunken ships. Because storms can come up on the Gulf of Aqaba uh, at a moment's notice. And there is a, a debris field all through the Gulf of Aqaba of gears and pulleys and wheels on ships that are covered in coral. So I could go on about this for a long time. But we know, first of all, the other, the, I'll say this and then I'll, I'll put a pin on it. And that is, is that um, the other thing that we know that the shore wilderness is on the eastern frontier and that this is the region that they, they came out of when they came out of the, that's because if you're, if you're in the wall wilderness, you look on a map, the eastern frontier of Egypt, the Gulf of Suez is the nearest point that you, know, that you need to get to to cross through the sea. And the other reason is, is that in, in Breshid, in Genesis, we're told of the, 
the, the fact that um, when Sarah had a, a controversy with her handmaiden, um, Hagar, that Hagar packed up and left, and she was found wandering on the road to Shur. Okay? The road to Shur. Why was she on the road to Shur? Who was she the daughter of, Rabbi? She was the daughter of Pharaoh. Okay, if she's going to leave Sarah's home, she's, and she's going to go home, she's going to go back to Egypt. If, 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 the, if the wilderness of Shur is on the other side of the Gulf of Aqaba, if we're to believe that, what is Hagar doing all the way over on a road that takes her to Saudi Arabia? And by the way, that would take her weeks to get there on her own. So it makes, it, it makes sense that the road to Shur was a road that took her back to Egypt, back to the eastern frontier, by the way, back to the wall that was built there originally by the pharaohs to keep people from going in or out like wow. slaves. And we even have a story called the, the, from the Egyptian, from the Egyptian <clears throat> ancient literature called the story of Sinhue. And it's about a slave who tries to leave Egypt by going over this famous wall that was built there. It was called the Wall of the Rulers. And we are now wow. finding archaeological proof of buried walls all along the eastern frontier of Egypt. They've been exposed now. I'll stop. So, Just like Chazal say, that no slave was able to escape. Well, one was able to escape, but he didn't. He wasn't a slave, and he didn't, he didn't try to go through the wall. He went to Ethiopia. And we, you know who I'm talking about. I know who you mean, yeah. Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, of course, he wasn't a slave, but he had to leave. Uh, he had to flee the country, but he went to Ethiopia, to what was, that we, we call Kush in, in the Tanakh. Thank you for those fascinating insights, Jim. It was well, really I'm sorry I, didn't, I sorry I didn't use a map, and I, I, I forgot to. So, um, well, one time, one time we, I'd like you to present your whole, your whole findings. Oh, by the way, I do get into that, a little plug. If you want some, uh, doing Ohel Moed, if you want to uh, see this in an expanded version, um, I invite people, if they don't already know about it, to tune in or to find the, the or look on this same channel, the, the Jerusalemites channel, that they're watching this podcast, and we have a documentary called Riddle of the Exodus, and I address many of these points about the veracity of the Exodus, and, the, and I offer evidence of it. Excellent. Jim, I want to bless you with a wonderful Passover. Thank you. May it be very, very spiritually fulfilling, enjoyable, and may it be um, absolutely uplifting. And all of our listeners and viewers take this opportunity to really thank Hashem for uh, taking us out of our personal Egypt to really making a commitment to Him and asking how we can better continue on our, on our path of ascent and leave Egypt behind forever. Like I like to say about Yul Brynner, you know, bye-bye. Thank you very much, but we're going now. It's been nice. We're going home now. Yeah. And, and he would, as Brynner's character would say, it is so it is written, so it, it will be so. <laughs> so it shall be. So Chag Hashem V'Sameach, have a wonderful, wonderful, beautiful Passover, everybody, and may it truly be the new year of our faith in Hashem, and may we go from here from strength to strength. Amen. Hag Sameach to you and Hag Sameach to all of our audience. Hag Sameach.